We're live today with our guest, Dr. Joel Kim. Um, can you tell us about like what you do in terms of your occupation? Yeah, so I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Uh, I'm a, a focus on functional manual therapy. I'm, I'm also a certified functional manual therapist. So what does it mean to be a functional manual therapist? Uh, it basically means uh, you know, evaluating the human body and, uh, and looking at the paradigm of functional manual therapy, which is evaluating one's mechanical capacity, neuromuscular function, and motor control. So how does that differ from like a physical therapist? Uh, it's, it's a little bit more. So uh, there's a lot of paradigms out there. Uh, in regards to functional manual therapy, it's, it's uh, looking at a patient as like one unit, kind of seeing the whole rather than looking at if the knee, if someone has a knee problem or only the neck if someone has a neck problem. So how does one become or end up as a functional therapist? Like, can you take us through like how you started here? Like when you were a kid, do you like grow up with the dream to become a, a functional therapist? Oh, no, not at all. Um, this is actually my third career. <clears throat> so what was your first two careers? So my first career was uh, in the Marine Corps, and then the second one was in commercial construction. So how do you get to the Marine Corps? Let's start with that. Yeah, so, um, so you know, I, I grew up in the Korean American church, and everyone wanted to be a teacher and a pastor so I went towards that route and when I went to undergrad uh, I was studying history as my major and between my second and third year it didn't quite feel right and everyone around me was from the local Korean American church and so I thought that they had to be more to life so I signed a contract and enlisted in the Marine Corps and I went to boot camp and I absolutely loved it. I actually graduated in top 10% of my class. Not that I meant to, but my senior drill instructor called me out in the third phase of training and made me third squad leader. So as holding a leadership bill at that, I'm like, would put me in the 10%. <clears throat> and then I went back to school to finish my bachelor's degree. And because I was out of school for a while, it was hard for me to get into the academics. So I changed my major to sociology because then I decided to go for my commission to be a commission officer of Marines. And I got my bachelor's degree, went to Oxford Canada School. I graduated in top 25% of my class. I just loved it. And, uh, and basically, uh, I, I just love being a Marine. And one year when I was a first lieutenant, I pissed off the XO. <clears throat> And he wrote me an adverse fitness report, an annual review. And a few years down the line, you know, I picked up captain. And then I was on the board to become major. And at that time, I was so pissed off at the Marine Corps. <laughs> and because uh, I hated my job, which was logistics. Because I it was tired of getting crapped on. Well, that's the most important job. Yes, it is. Amateurs talk tactics. The professionals are on the logistics. That that's is right. that is that right? That's, I, I guess so. I, I never heard that before. Where, where'd you hear that? From like some military book I read, because like I I at least I like might be a history major, probably business, but I like history a lot. You know, it's my passion, oh. and like I read a lot of books about I guess or like videos about you know warfare and stuff. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, what ends up winning is just logistics, like how much power you can bring to the fold in a certain amount of time. And the U.S. military does a lot on logistics. Like, they do a great job. Like, compared to any other military, you have all these massive planes, cargo. You can refuel places around the world. That's where we spend all our money, I guess. <laughs> That's what makes the U.S. really expeditionary. Yeah. So what do you do on your logistics job? Oh, so pretty much everything that you said. You know, it's... Um which includes motor transportation, maintenance, utility, engineering, armory, uh, uh, weapons, safety, hazardous materials, embarkation, uh, so that the supply shop falls under our list. Uh, uh, facilities, uh, food falls under our umbrella. 
Uh, the medical side falls under our umbrella, so the corpsmen, so we're in charge of responsible for the corpsmen. Um, that's on the top of my head. So it's pretty much almost uh, more than 60% of headquarters. So, um, <laughs> so what years were you in the military? That was the time span. Yeah, I uh, went to boot camp January 5, 1998, and I got out in 2012. Oh, uh, you see any deployment, like active duty? Uh, 2003, yeah. Iraq? Yeah. Well, thank you for your service. Yeah, you're very welcome. How was that experience? Oh, it sucked. I was a, I was a second lieutenant at the time, so I didn't know very much. And so I made a lot of mistakes, and it wasn't training where you make a mistake, and then the OODA loop, the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, was very quick. Like, it's a 30-day camping trip. You come back, and you do after action, and you go, oh, okay, let's... We've got lesson learned, let's apply that again. This was war. <laughs> so it is a 30-day camping trip. It's very many months of camping trip. And this is constant, you know, constant operations. And also, you know, long periods of boredom. You know, trying to figure out ways to, you know, not do stupid stuff. <laughs> and uh, so I made a lot of mistakes. And I had a supervisor who he and I didn't get along very well. He's from Nebraska, you know, the Midwest, pretty conservative guy. And you're from this area, I assume, with the Korean church? Yeah, uh, Southern California dude. So he had a certain way of uh, leading, you know, kind of a, a little hard ass, hard ash is. And uh, we bump heads a few times, and, uh, you know, he had, had the higher billet, higher rank. So it, it was hell in many ways for me. It sucked. Right, do you see I like the actual know. combat side or was it for you like more like the like the grinding like you know essence of war where like because I hear a lot about from like veterans the boredom is half the time you're in very like hectic situations and long periods of boredom you have to wait. Was it like that for you? Yeah it's a lot of uh, hurry up and wait. But were there moments where you like where do you ever go into like actual combat or were you like doing the stuff behind the scenes it was uh more of the stuff behind the scenes and i haven't killed anyone and i haven't shot anyone and i really don't want to have that i'm glad i never had the experience of shooting someone or having killed anyone i have i've had close calls uh uh one time you know we we're uh we just captured uh, the first airfield and um just this is right miles, at the beginning? Yeah. About 20 miles Desert south. Desert Storm, right? Uh, no. Oh, no, it was uh, after. Iraqi Freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So we, it was during the Battle of Nazaria, and our convoy was moving up uh, to occupy the LZ and do operations out of there. And uh, just to keep it short, it's supposed to be an eight-hour drive, turned out to be a 28-hour drive. <laughs> and imagine doing that like in a... In a tactical vehicle, so it's like driving a CJ7 Jeep with quote unquote air conditioning, <laughs> right? Which means no air conditioning with all your NBC gear on and weapons and stuff like that. There's no leg room, and you're driving all night long, and you just have the radio to your head. And uh, it's just anyway, so uh, I had a close call of shooting someone, and uh, you know, barely woke up. I, I woke up, <laughs> I fell asleep as a shotgun guy a driver but you know got woken up and there was a white nissan truck with blue lightning stripes on it it's about 200 yards away and then uh my driver woke me up and said hey sir there's a truck out there and i was like holy crap so anyway so uh four guys in it 200 yards away pointing my weapon at it and that was the first time i ever pointed my weapon at a human being and it was surreal it was absolutely surreal it's like it wasn't black uh, silhouette target it was human beings and I remember my thought was, I can't believe, my first thought was, I can't believe this happening. And number two, could I do my job? And number three, um, uh, number three, I'm trying to remember, but uh, it was like, uh, I, I just couldn't believe. It. Anyway, so they, they saw us coming out of the Humvee uh, M998 and four of us pointing our weapons, walking towards them. And the driver all the, the three guys in there were like telling the driver like you know they're doing their Middle Eastern arms waving in the air whatever they're talking inside how they communicate 
and then the driver put his hand up and told him calm down he stopped the vehicle and he turned around made a u-turn and went away i was like holy crap that was so close and uh then we went back to the the humvee and then the exo called on the radio this is like you know zero five zero five fifteen in the morning right when the sun was rising and on the radio the exo was calling key personnel and uh, so I was in charge of my stick of 10 vehicles. I walked over, and it was weird because I, I, I was just about a bar. I walked over, you know, you got the CEO, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Exo was a captain. You got all these high brass there. And I walk up there, and I didn't report what happened because I was just like, it just didn't come to my mind that I needed to be reported. I was like, uh, whatever. <laughs> I probably should have said something, but that, that was the first. So that was my close call with. Um, close to shooting someone and another one getting shot at I think a couple mornings later so we were at the LZ it was one of those infamous sandstorms and we couldn't even see like two arm lengths in front of us and uh, me and the first lieutenant were doing the latest recon with the CO, key personnel with the senior staff and uh, we're and I got this picture where I'm standing in there with my NBC gear and I'm holding the Shaka sign and I got my M16 over my shoulder. I got my M9 on my thigh holster, or um, on my on my chest. Sorry, because we're in convoy ops. Because it's easier to draw with a weapon in your chest rather than on your thigh. Because if you try to draw, your elbow hits the door, and that causes problems. Anyway, so it, uh, <clears throat> so we're walking down, and I asked the first lieutenant. He's like, he's charge security. He said, or I said, hey, because um, we're all tired and grumpy. I was like, hey, uh, can you take a picture of me? He's like. Of what? Right? And I was like, oh, this great scenery. And I was like, ah, oh, whatever. And it was one of those wind-up Kodak things, you know, in 2003, whatever it was. So I pulled it out, one of my ammo pouches of the magazine for the M16, and the Kodak camera fit right in there. I pulled it out, gave it to him, took a picture. And he gave it back to me as he's rewinding it. And I'm like, oh, I appreciate that. And we're just, you know, just lighting the mood. And right when he hands it back to me, keep in mind you're in a sandstorm, so you can't hear anything. It's like, in your ears and in that background you hear and we're like what the hell is he saying right and so there's no speakers out there so the way that you send messages out there is you repeat what you hear and it's called sounding off so we're just waiting for the sound off to come to us and it gets a little louder a little clearer and then finally we hear a racket company size element three miles away get back to the trucks and then me and the security guy was like, holy crap! And then we start booking it for the truck. And we stopped and we holy cow, wait, we got to grab the CO. And then we turned out, I was like, where the hell is the CO? Because <laughs> you can't see anything. You, you can't even, the, the footsteps disappear, right? And uh, so we're like, ah, he'll figure it out. Because he's got like everyone with him. So hey, he'll figure it out. So we ran back to the trucks. And, um, and we got it back into... The, the Humvee, and we called it the Gypsy Truck because it was a company Gunny's truck, so it was really cool. And it had pots of pans hanging off of it. It had a coffee maker on it. It has a generator on the trailer. It was just a really nice truck to hang out hang out on. So we got in the truck, and we're like, holy crap. And I conditioned one my weapon. I racked it, put it around in the chamber, you know, and I, and I uh, side line the side picture down the sides. And as, as I'm looking outside, all of a sudden the bed of the trucks are jumping up and down because everyone was coming into the truck. Like, okay, they all figured it out. And everyone's getting to the truck. And then you hear the Humvee start up. The way the M998 starts up. And then it's like, okay, hurry up, hurry up. It's like, we're up. And then we drove it back to the LZ because we crossed the front line. And I remember crossing back into our, uh, our uh, line of departure. And you can see as far as the eyes can see in that sandstorm, <laughs> right? Of just a whole bunch of United States Marines and NBC suits just get to their fine holes. And I was like, this is the safest place right now. Because as far as you can see, you can see United States Marines to your left, manning their holes. And all the way to the right, as far as you can see, manning the holes. And you see those squad leaders just doing their moto thing. Like saying, hey, you know, pumping their arms, you know, get the ammo, da 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 you know immediate action drill they're all coming in there now i'm like i just can't wait for them to show up because we're gonna freaking light them up <laughs> so anyway so that that was a, a close call where i got sh almost got shot at but i i never shot anyone killed anyone or or been shot at 
Um, so yeah. like the Marines, like they're known for their mindset, I guess, compared to the other forces. Like, would you say that's like influenced like your work or how you like approach life? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like how so? Uh, well, since I became a physical therapist, I, I have to kind of filter. I have to do a lot of filtering because in the Marine Corps, it's the business of killing. Yeah. And the physical therapy is <laughs> business of healing. So, uh, so how it, how that mindset of, of the Marines kind of got me to where I'm at is is just to have a can-do attitude and sometimes the simplest, most direct path is the most is the best path until it's proven incorrect. And then sometimes a round circle fits in a square peg with the appropriate amount of force <laughs> <laughs> and and just knowing just being purposeful and intentional and being focused i guess that type of mindset is uh i've i've, I've changed a lot since then so it's weird for me to answer your question to to pull back to that because i'm still trying to figure out how to manage it now but in retrospect to answer your question that's pretty much what's what's gotten me through to where i am today so you were out you went in college didn't really like see how that was going so you went to the Marine Corps, and like, how do you get into the construction and ultimately physical therapy? So I got out of active duty, and when I got active duty, I needed a job. <clears throat> I also had some PTSD and stuff. I was all messed up. <laughs> it was pretty bad, very dark, <clears throat> and I found Jesus. Anyway, so I needed a job, so my, back, my trade was logistics. <clears throat> and I had an old high school friend who worked for a construction company and he said, hey, we're hiring. We need someone to get these job sites. You got logistics. You're a freaking United States Marine. I think it'd be a great fit. I said, okay. So I got hired on the spot. Um, I hated it. And I actually got fired two years later from the job by the vice president. And what he's, because it was a Korean owned uh, small construction company. And the vice president pulled me in. He said, Joel, you know, you're, I think because you've been an officer, you're used to functioning a certain way. And the culture in this company doesn't quite adapt to that very well. You know, think of your high level rather than, you know, being told what to do and get here and, you know, say, okay, yes, okay, I'm sorry about that. It's really, I, you know, I, I, I speak my mind. I put my foot down when I think something is wrong. And I figure a way to navigate it to, to do the right thing. Anyway, so uh, that's just something about, I think, Korean owned companies, but it may be a construction. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not the expert on that. And so it, it was really scary for me because I need to pay my bills. And and so I said, well, let's let's see what if what he said is correct. So an opportunity landed in my lap a, a couple months later to work with Clark Construction which is a very large construction company. And it's, a, it's basically the dream job for anyone who works in construction. You want to work for Clark Construction. And they hired me on as a safety coordinator. They knew my background. And because they saw me in the military, they put me on as a safety coordinator, which is like pretty much the cop on the job site. I guess everyone in the military, they become cops. Anyway, so I worked on a couple projects and I was blessed to be on that, and I absolutely hated it uh, because Groundhog Day, F and you're on. For me, it was being on a job site, and I just couldn't handle you know uh, fifty year old men uh, with four, five hundred, six hundred guys on the job site acting like junior high kids, and I had few people who didn't like me on the job site because I had a college education, and uh, I was threatened by a few. Iron Man, uh, no, uh, there's no second, uh, third generation uh, iron workers, and uh, and when they found out it was Marine Corps, they laid off the pressure. I was like, this is kind of stupid. Like, why did I kind of put up with this? And I had a really abusive supervisor um, at my last project that I was with them, and uh, he was, you know, born in Louisiana, blue collar hard ass, had a dad who had a company, he didn't want to do the company thing, his dad got pissed off, you know, 
pretty much disowned his son. His son joined the army, became a medic, got out, and you know, just that kind of a life experience. So he kind of uh, replicates that, I think, with the people in life. I said, the stupid, I'd rather do something else, and I just want to help people. And so then I decided to go into physical therapy. Wow. So, like, how does one become a physical therapist? <laughs> That's the logical extension. It's yeah. like a school you go to, like, learn the physical therapy. And, like, how do you get that, like, Eastern, like, like component to it? Because, like, for the people uninitiated, um, I met Dr. Um, Joel Kim. Like, my dad introduced him, introduced him to me because um, he said, like, he's pretty good. And, like, he's, like, kind of, like... A physical therapist but like with some eastern medicine like chiropractic addition i guess is the way like you'd explain it like up front if you didn't know anything and so like how do you get that skill set because the reason why um dr joel is on is his skill set's very incredible like i don't know if you if you like whatever like have a session with him very in-depth knowledge about stuff you wouldn't really expect but all very cohesive it makes a lot of sense so how do you develop that it's through i Number one, I would say that I don't recommend my path. <laughs> it's the most painful way to go uh, in that way. So, the so first of all, you got to uh, make to PT school. And right now, it's a doctorate level. So uh, you got to uh, finish all your prereqs like med school. So you got and at so this. You went to med school. Uh no, uh, I went to Pasadena City College <laughs> to do all my prerequisites. So before I was a basically a history sociology major right and I had to go to passing us I had to do my prerequisites <clears throat> so I had to do all my sciences I did past college so two semesters of physics two semesters of chemistry one semester of anatomy another physiology medical terminology etc cetera, etc cetera. <clears throat> uh, and and uh, uh, microbio so it just looks like med school so all that good stuff yeah, and uh, I got pretty much straight A's when I went through, and I got into PT school on the first first try, and which was uh, such a blessing to do because the competition was very high. I mean, you think about right now, you got fifteen hundred applicants with fifty seats, and so you can imagine how competitive that can be. So uh, you've got to pretty much do all your med school prereqs. And you gotta get really good grades. And if they're not good enough, you gotta go back to, you gotta go back, retake the class and get just higher grade, just to bump up your GPA. And you gotta take your GRE, get get really good score, higher than 1,000, I think. It will depend by the program. So that's how you get in. Then you do the three year program, uh, DPT program. Uh, for me, it's four years. And that's, uh, that's another dra dramatic story. There's some, uh, people didn't like me uh, because the goals that I set uh, weren't your typical physical therapist and some people found that threatening. So what goals were you setting up? Well, the goal that I set was to be involved with the California Physical Therapy Association, particularly with the San Gabriel Valley District. And my first clinical rotation during my third year, uh, there was someone there who... Uh, shared the same goal that I did and for some strange reason I got dropped during that first clinical rotation and I think it caused a lot of confusion for the uh, for our chair our director of clin ed <laughs> and my family so we got we pretty much for some BS reason got a scarlet letter on our chest and so we had to add one more year to the program and uh, anyway, so that that's how I got delayed on that. Mm. Yeah. So you think it's like the Marines that like makes people not like you sometimes? Yeah. It seems like you had no issue with people not liking you until you joined the Marines. Um. Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's yeah. like the disagreeableness. Like you still say what you think. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to disagree. I, I just. Well, like you won't like just you just like say like your truth and like be right. Like if I go for a job interview, you know, if I I'm very honest for what I'm looking for, I think any employer would want that honesty. You know, I'm not the one to really. <laughs> well, if I really needed to, but 
you know, it's I just stay true to myself, and uh, I just I just uh, the the sanding board bounces off, and it's a win win, which is what I'm always looking for. Then then I know I can actually uh, bring value to whatever I'm interviewing for. The <laughs> So actually, let's do our sponsor spot right now. Oh, okay, right on. So guys, um, we're sponsored by Archon Incorporated. Buy their mounts and mounting solutions. This is all filmed on Archon Mounting Solutions. Check out our camera right here. Archon mount right there. And um, thanks for the help. So we'll just, if you ever need a mounting solution to put something on something, just get an Archon mount. Okay, and we're back to it. So, um, you got all your like regular physical therapy training done and like what made you like want to pursue like this other type of like I guess added knowledge and how you approach it like do you say you have this added component of like Eastern medicine in your own practice uh, not at all it was uh, how, how I got there was through a lot of pain so the pain continued after I graduated <laughs> so um, you follow the pain to get a good business idea that's what my dad's always said. Oh, okay. You follow the pain because when Your people have pain, they'll very pay sweet. you. Mm. Got it. Okay. All right. The pain of Archon mounts. My dad does Archon mounts. Is that people want to put stuff on stuff? Mm. And I, I might hit up some Arc in in Archon mount. I need one. We can. We'll gift you one actually. Cool. Awesome. We have so many mounts. I, I need the the spider thing that wraps around a. Uh, like a tripod or something like that. My dad would definitely want to cook you up with something like that. Oh, thank you. Um, man, okay. Yeah, so um, so I, I, I graduated, right? I graduated. And my first year of practice, I felt really inadequate. And so I applied for a residency program, and I was, again, honest with uh, what, I, what my goal was. And so I put it on there, and... I didn't think I would get an interview. I got an interview, so I I went in for the interview for the residency program. I applied for residency program, and um, it was the strangest uh, interview, professional interview, because the first question that they asked, I answered it honestly, and my interview slammed her head on the table. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, the question was, uh, where where do you want to work? And I said here. And it was, I think it was a little unfair because I should have elaborated saying, hey, I really hate my job and I'd rather work anywhere else and this is the next one. So I'd, I'd rather work here. I should have clarified on that. Um, and they asked a second question, which I don't remember what the question was, but I just remember she slammed her head on the ground again. And I'm like, why what kind am of I... Yes, head on the ground? Yes, I know, right? <laughs> Every time I share this story, they're like, what? <laughs> and the director of rehab was there too, which I guess unusual for her to be there at an interview for someone just applying for a residency program. Um, so I didn't get into the uh, residency program. Um, I, I followed up on the interview and I didn't get in, and it was for some uh, some BS reason. And so I got really pissed off. I said, I'm fed up with this profession. I barely started and no one likes me. And so I said, well, I, I, I got to do something about this. So I, su I remember exactly, I was in the back in the laundry area where I was working at the private clinic. I hung up the phone, I decided that starting tonight, every day, no matter what, I'm going to study research until midnight. I'm just gonna read research, get myself more educated and mentor myself uh, on diagnosis, prognosis, intervention, and prognosis with physical therapy. And I did that for 12 months. And my wife absolutely hated it. And uh, at the end of the 12 months, uh, that's about the time when I quit my first job and I did travel physical therapy because then I was like, okay, so I need to understand where my skill is with the industry in comparison to my peers and or my years of practice and our skill level. And during my trial physical therapy, I, I learned that I was actually above average. I was actually complimented uh, uh, 
lauditly and copiously uh, by uh, someone who uh, does did mentors for a residency program. I asked him to sit in on eval with me, and after the eval, I was like, Joel, that was that was the most thorough and amazing eval for someone that I've ever seen uh, for a new grad. And I said, Wow, I really appreciate that. And uh, so it was during this journey that I was doing this residency that uh, through my pain and unhappiness, and uh, I got some friends who really took me under the wing and, and got me through, um, that I found the Institute of Physical Art. And I took one class uh, with Vicki Johnson. <laughs> Vicki, if you're listening, or Greg. Or anyone that's do physical art, and uh, I took the PNF course, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. That was my first course, 2016. And yes, I did learn PNF at PT school. It was like arm patterns and lower extremity patterns, uh, but this was really different. It was learning handholds, the nine principles of phys- uh, PNF, and it was PNF? Uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So it's basically using your hands to uh, you know, turn on muscles and getting the core to kick on, like instantly. And I'll sh- I'll show you next time. I've actually um, felt this. It's kind of oh. like sort of like like adjusting your joints in like real time. You'll like see your body respond. Very interesting with the techniques. And uh, after I took that course, I had. Uh, "Quote unquote frozen shoulder patients." "Quote unquote," because the diagnosis was the medical diagnosis was wrong. But that Monday, uh, that pa- I did the evaluation, and he was able to raise our up to shoulder level, and then uh, I was able to uh, help passively take his arm to full range. So it wasn't a true frozen shoulder; it was just limited motion, but was lim- missing something to help to take it the rest of the way. So anyway, so. Uh, that first visit, I did my first PNF intervention after that course, and in six visits with me, just doing PNF, he got full range of motion on that right shoulder, and it was unheard of. And the front desk and the physical therapy aides was like, "Man, Doctor Joel is amazing. What are you doing?" I said, "I don't know." <laughs> so you, just, you didn't know how you got him to get full range of motion. I had no idea. All I did was just. When I was taught uh, that weekend at the technical level, like you put your hands here and you put your verbal cue like this, and you, and then you, and then you show them this, and you give them resistance this way, and that was it. And that was the level, my skill level back then. And so I said, "There's got to be more to this." And so I took the next course, FM one. Um, where you're learning uh, Greg's method of soft tissue mobilization, which by the way, Greg Johnson termed soft tissue mobilization and presented it to the combined sections uh, meeting to the American Physical Therapy Association in 1979. And uh, that's term, the, the acronym for that's STM. And basically uh, he was laughed off stage after he presented his idea because all the peers were basically saying, that's massage stuff. We don't do massages. We do these cool joint mobs. And it was during that time in the 70s that you had these uh, big influencers in the physical therapy professions such as Syriacs and Calterborn and all these big names doing these cool joint stuff. And here's Greg Johnson presenting soft tissue mobilization. So uh, anyway, so I took FM1 and I just, I just fell in love with it. I said, this is the answer that I've been looking for. Uh, in my practice and it's been getting great results so then I, I drank the Kool-Aid and uh, <laughs> and I actually uh, registered for certification in functional manual therapy as a CFM tier without taking any of the advanced courses and uh, that's when I first met my mentor Greg it was an FM2 course which is now we're learning how to put all the pieces together uh, with Greg terms as functional movement patterns, which he uh, adopted uh, from many things to include Feldenkrais, and he used Feldenkrais uh, movements What's with Feldenkrais. Uh, Feldenkrais is this guy who uh, 
developed what's called Awareness Through Movement, ATM, which is basically uh, someone who is in pain or got some movement dysfunction, you have them do these basic uh, developmental movement patterns. You have them doing really slow, really methodically in order to restore the movement or reduce the pain. And uh, Greg adapted those movements with functional mobilization, meaning instead of just have the pa patient passively move through, why don't you just put your hand on the problem and use your other hand to find the source and you have that patient continue to move through with function movement pattern. So you find like whatever is responsible for like that's connected to the issue is at hand. Yes. So you just feel like where it's going wrong pretty much. Yes. I see. So a lot of like these like passive methods of discovery that you like you wouldn't really see normally. Yeah, he was uh uh I have to say I I really uh he was really ahead of his time. I think it's commonly understood that Greg was uh, ahead of his time. And for example, the one example that he uses pretty common is in the 80s, he was uh, teaching physical therapists how to palpate the psoas, which is the hip flexor uh, in front of the spine. So you got to uh, feel it through the stomach. And at the time in the 80s, <clears throat> that was the crazy thing to do because uh, the the crazy thing was, well, what if you rupture the main artery in the abdomen, right? And they bleed to death because you're trying to uh, feel for the psoas and treat it. Did you like feel that hard that it might rupture it? Yeah, well, which which you can't rupture the aorta unless they got some severe medical condition. But that was in the 1980s or in the 80, 80s. Now these days, you know, you run to almost every physical therapist and they'll they'll put their hand on the psoas and they go ahead and mobilize it and, and treat the psoas. And so that's an example of how Greg was ahead of his time. Physical therapy seems like a lot like more complicated than I first imagined. It's like a lot to it, isn't there? In terms of like, well, I guess you're talking about the whole body and how it all connects to each other. Like, what would you say like really differs from like, say a traditional doctor that you just see like but once like every six months that your regular therapist like I mean your regular appointments would like do like say you got a conventional doctor and you have like a shoulder issue I guess mm. how would they approach it compared to a physical therapist like you so what they would probably do so so the job of the medical doctor is to uh, diagnose the problem because they're at top of the food chain in the healthcare system so from their diagnosis, everyone gets to work. For, for the doctor of physical therapy, uh, what they can do is they'll, they'll medically screen the patient, uh, meaning they'll be looking for what's called red flags, which is like, ooh, okay, yeah, you need to see your medical doctor for this first. Like, uh, you know, uh, vertebral basilar artery insufficiency, you know, the blood going to the head in certain positions if it reproduces dizziness or changes in how one talks, right? Or uh, maybe um, some strange feeling in their, in their hands or even their feet from just by putting their heads in different positions. That's like, oh, okay. Is that like injury related, biological? Like, I didn't know people could, like, have those issues of, like, you should move your hand and you start messing stuff up. Yeah, so uh, if, if it's acute trauma, you know, that can cause those things. Um, sometimes chronicity can also affect those things. Even other than musculoskeletal, it can be caused by some metabolic issues, such as autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis or ehlers Danlos Syndrome. All those things causes severe laxity in the neck area. And so when you put the head in certain positions, that would reproduce those strange uh, symptoms. So what can you directly treat then? So if like any issues that like might like, I guess internal needs some like medicine or surgery, you would like refer back to the doctor. But then like, what would you do? Like, I guess like what's your, what's your role in the whole medical ecosystem? Yeah, uh, so so I do outpatient physical therapy. So anything that's related musculoskeletal. Mm. 
and that even includes headaches, migraines, other than just pain, stiffness, um, dizziness is another thing. Um, well, those are big ones because mm -hmm. I know there's like not really like a straightforward treatment for headaches. Like for people having acute my like chronic migraines, like there's nothing you can really give someone besides like an Advil. Well, there there's a lot more that can be done for migraines. Yeah. Medically or just like what you do. Uh, for what I do. Yeah. Like for what well, I'm saying, like there's no pill that that would just give you like all oh, your headaches would go away. Uh, there might be, but I'm not aware of one that like commonly prescribed. What sometimes, uh, well, I, this is not medical <laughs> advice here, but uh, just in my uh, anecdotal type of experience thus far, you know, I've, there are some patients that have popped Excedrin, and that seems to help with their migraine. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that's interesting. So, um, you like did a lot of the research on yourself, like twelve p.m. every night, twelve a.m. Like, what do you start learning doing your own like deep intensive studies uh, I'm just learning uh, the diagnosis so what the problem is uh, how to treat it and how long it's gonna take so um, do you say like do you ever look to Eastern like I guess techniques or wisdom in like conjunction with like your traditionally Western trained um, I guess all your certificates and whatnot. Yeah, so I I haven't directly studied Eastern medicine. Uh, in my practice, what I find is that when I work with patients, they see a lot of parallel <laughs> with Eastern medicine, and I'm not trying to be parallel with Eastern medicine. It's but but it's really interesting to me. And then sometimes uh, there's some things that uh, in Eastern medicine, for example, like uh, something like big toe to the liver. And I've had a couple patients where um, they've had, like for example, uh, you know, one patient, you no know, history with, uh, they, they fractured their toe and uh, just walk in the backyard and they just want to help to make it look normal. So it was not really pain, not really stiffness. It was more kind of aesthetic treatment of a physical therapy. And that's one of the treatments that uh, I can help with. Um, and we went through a few visits that started to plateau out. And so what I told her was we need to start looking somewhere else or the money that you're paying to see me, uh, it may not feel like it's worth it. And I like to keep this momentum going because when it slows down, uh, I don't think you're going to be very happy with the money that you're spending. And I just was honest with her. She said, okay. And uh, we found stuff in the liver. And so I put my hand on her lower rib cage around her liver. And I put my other hand on her, on her big toe. And I moved it in a certain way that we knew that we kept moving it in in a quote-unquote functional movement pattern in a creative way for her big toe that really helped the foot. And so we moved that big toe in the same way, and there was a tug on her liver. Wow. And then so uh, we got her on the table, we released the restriction, and then she got her movement back on the big toe. And uh, she was older, adult, so I knew that there had to be some uh, uh, fascial component. And I just when I thin slice it, that, that's been my experience thus far, and the older adults usually... Because, you know, they've got a lot of life experiences, uh, uh, you know, mental, emotional, and physical. So usually that fascial work, really, they really benefit with that, especially early on in their plan of care. That's what I find in the work that I So see. you're Western trained, but, like, a lot of your methods, like, your patients have reported, is, like, like, lining up in some ways with Eastern medicine. Is that true? Yes. The foot stuff's interesting, because uh, my dad's actually a big proponent of that. Like, when I actually, because my dad, um like in the 70s, 80s, I mean, we spent time in Taiwan, learned Chinese, learned the business culture there. Because China wasn't open yet. I mean, Taiwan was like a backwater, but it's free, you know? Mm. And um, he'd always go to like, I guess when he had an ailment, like the foot massage, like those type of doctors there. And so like, he would always like, he learned it to do himself eventually, like the help of his headaches or like help with whatever stuff. Mm. And like you'd press certain points on the foot and some of them would hurt. And if you keep working through that pain, eventually like, at least I would know some sort of improvement. 
you know, how you're overall feeling. And there's, like, there's lots of different, um, I guess, like, Chinese medicine where they talk a lot about, like, certain points in your body, acupuncture. Is that, in a way, its own, like, type of physical therapy that's been developed over a long time? Yeah. Probably. As it seems like that. Like, it's, I guess it's a different way to approach medicine, because, um... One thing I learned recently, I was reading about the Mongols and like, mm. you know, Genghis Khan took over all of Eurasia, Asia. Mm. And one of the things was on like Chinese and um, Middle Eastern medicine, they got blended in terms of like the Middle East at that time was more advanced in things like surgery. And but China, like a lot of the acupuncture, like point methods seem to like coalesce. So I guess like you could say it's folk medicine or like traditional medicine. But I guess like there's some knowledge in that that must have like at least been found out or to like propagate. And so you're seeing that now in like the ways you approach your physical therapy? Yeah, so how I've been finding those things and and uh, those connections, which is why I think a lot of my patients have been asking about the Eastern medicine, is uh, that um, I just find it in my hands. <laughs> so and, and I give kudos to, you know, my... You know, my, my mentors and really uh, challenged me to uh, kind of think like Neo in the Matrix, you know, rather than just thinking like uh, Mr. Smith, you know, or maybe just the peons walking around the Matrix is really, uh, really pushing yourself and having that permission to think in certain ways. And so, um, so it's so because of, I, I know that because what I, I, I feel the pull in my hands and I know that as a fact and uh, so as a result when a patient would say hey do you, how does this relate to Eastern medicine I think what they're sensing is that yes there is a truth here somewhere with uh, the treatment that they're getting and what they know about the Eastern medicine so I definitely agree yeah there I think that some of those Eastern uh, Asian people <laughs> I'm Asian myself so I kind of say that yeah, they, they were onto something yeah. So there's like some sort of like deeper understanding of medicine that we haven't really reached yet in terms of figuring everything out, right? Yeah, and they're continuing to figure stuff out, even in Western medicine. Yeah. yeah. So eventually, maybe we get to like a coalescent point where we understand. Because there's a lot, a lot of stuff we don't understand about how the human body really works. Oh, yeah. It's a very adaptable organism. Yeah. What, what I tell my patients going going back to the truth and the western eastern medicine is usually if i have a patient uh so i'm just going to give my spiel of the truth part right so sometimes i may get a patient that says um you know my personal trainer tells me to do this but you're telling me to do this what do i do and so what I'll do is, as example, I'll pull something up, like uh, maybe like uh, maybe like uh, uh, deck, let's say deck of cards here, right? And so I'll hold up a deck of cards, and I'll say something like, "Hey Jacob, so let's say this card represents truth, okay? So I'm looking at truth, and it's an ace of spades, okay? And then you're gonna say, Doctor Joel, you're full of crap." Because I'm looking at the card that you're holding up. It's not an ace of spades. It's got this blue on the back with all these patterns. There is no ace and there is no spades. And then so I said, oh, that's interesting. And so what, what we're going to do is, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip that card to see what you're talking about. And I see that blue and you're going to see my ace of spades. And you're going to go, and I'm going to go, oh, okay, Jacob, I got it. It's blue on the back. I see the pattern. You're going to go, oh, okay, Dr. I see it. You got uh, two of spades. And then so we go back and forth like this and we're like, oh, wow, okay, there's something going on here. And so what we're going to do is now we're going to sit next to each other and we're going to hold this card together. And then as we flip it, we realize that it doesn't have to be right side up. Sometimes you could put it the long way and that gives a different look and you can keep twisting it. And as you keep twisting it, it keeps looking different. And what we realize is that I was right, you were right. And there's a lot more things that we're wrong about. So, like, there's different ways to approach the same problem as what you're trying to get at. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Hmm, it's interesting. So, um, what's, like, the main issue? Like, what's the main, like, people coming with ailments that come to you and, like, want to get that fixed? 
It's usually... Uh, well, let me guess. Knees, shoulders, back. Right, so that's your typical physical therapy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so usually the, the ones that I see are... Well, if it is knee, shoulder, back, uh, I, I mark it to the group that has tried many things and haven't gotten the results that they're looking for yet. And, um, and the reason why I think is because the service that I provide, I think they would prefer to use regular services for that. Um, but if it is something else, um, it's usually like um, headaches, migraines. Um, I had a patient who came to see me with uh, difficulty breathing. Uh, for some strange reason and she was cleared of COVID. She did a heart, lung, uh, brain, CT scan, everything was fine. No history of cancer, no diabetes. And, uh, and that, that, that was a pretty interesting case. Um, numbness or tingling, nerve related, uh, weakness. Uh, um, just work with a patient uh, who had stroke he was very high functioning and we were able to restore his walk-in mm. and the ability to move his arm um yeah it's uh it's it's i think it's things that physical therapy can help with that not many people are aware of that physical therapy can help with and this and what i provide is a skill set that can actually uh, diagnose a problem, I think, in novel ways that can really, because of that diagnosis, it really produces uh, uh, results in, in pretty wonderful ways. So, like, physical therapy, you don't really directly attack a problem. You're not putting someone under the knife. You're not giving them something to eat or take. So it's more, is it like, would you describe it as more of like, helping the body do what the body like wants to do, right? Yeah, like homeopathic, yeah. Kind of uh, giving the body a chance to do its thing. So what's your opinion on chiropractic? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one, because like, I mean, you guys like on the surface look similar, and mm -hmm. I've gone to a chiropractic mm -hmm. person before, one guy actually in the same town, San Marino, mm -hmm. and like, they like got these like things that like, Ch -ch 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 uh -huh. on your like back like and activators whatnot. yeah like but i've heard a lot of like negs on like chiropractic because there's i've learned that there's, there's some sort of like pseudo religion behind it in terms of like this meta science that also like i created chiropractic like created but then there's also other people who like don't like ignore that kind of and more talk about the benefits of like alignment so like what do you what's your take on chiropractors I actually like chiropractors, me personally. Um, I think they're a great adjunct to what, I, what I'm what i doing. Yeah, I've talked to that guy. Mm -hmm. I, I met one like a long time ago. I, I have one for you. And he, um, like my mom, like showed me this guy, he like told me to like, like eat like seaweed in your oatmeal with, mm. with um, like tomato, he's like that's very good for you. Oh, and I couldn't stomach it, so I never did. But no, never. I'm gonna try that. If he says healthy, I'll give it a try. I mean, Dad ate it for a while, and like he grew more hair. Oh, he did. Yeah, dude, I need hair. <laughs> I'm going bald. Hey, what's the, what's the, the hair loss stuff is difficult because like all the treatments like mess you up, like they make you feel like shit. That's what my dad mm. said at least. Okay. He's bald. Hopefully, I don't go bald. I heard a lot of people say sage is good for your hair as well. Oh. Dude, your dad was saying you could speak fluid Chinese? Yeah. Dude, that's insane. That is a gift. Don't lose that. You've got to let that. I worked in a um, Chinese restaurant for a while. Just oh, really? Practice. Wow. Why is it charging so slow? Dude, slow? my wife will love you. She um, she's, uh, she's, she's Taiwanese. Ah. Oh. Yeah, she speaks uh, Taiwanese. I can understand Shanghainese, but I'm sad I can't speak it. Mm. So, um, what's your opinion on the chiropractors again? Yeah, I, I actually like them. Um, now, I don't speak for the profession, <laughs> right? So, because uh, uh, 
professionally, you know, there's a fight with turf, right? With legally, you know, what physical therapists can or can't do, what chiropractors can or can't do, and in other turfs as well, with other professions. But um, because I believe that, you know, if we can, I mean, they're 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 here. You know, chiropractors are here, physical therapists are here, and so why not just make it work? There's some pros and cons. Everyone's got their strengths. I've got the weaknesses, and um, you know, I've 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 been I've almost been taken out by a chiropractor. Um, the chiropractor found out I was a PT, and then so uh, when he was nipping my back, he tried to take me out. Wait, what and, do you mean by that? Like he tried to manipulate me wrong to hurt my back. Well, that's not good. That was so not cool. That was so not that's cool. A dick move. That was really like what? <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> it's so not cool. That guy needs a different kind of therapist. Uh, anyway, so I I can appreciate where he's coming from. But do you think they can produce good results based on? I think so. Do? Yeah, I I get. Um, you know, I, I get adjustments like once a month. Um, I almost became a chiropractor before going to PT school um, because I, I recognized the value of the hand. Uh, but I wanted to work in a hospital, and that didn't work out for me uh, uh, because, you know, I feel like the physical therapist in a hospital setting, everyone's got to work like a team, quote-unquote. And so... Um, you know, you've got to share share every single patient <laughs> pretty much at every single day, at every single shift. And then so you want to try not to, you know, stand out too much for the sake of the patient, right? So if you're really, really good, and then the I feel like, at least in my experience, then the patient will only want to see you. And then so when the patient sees someone else, it kind of affects the that patient's prognosis. So that was my experience with the hospital thing, and I was like, "This is lame." Like, I don't. And if you suck, then you're at the bottom of the food chain at every company uh, meeting. So, I thought working in the hospital is stupid. So I ended up going to outpatient PT, which I should have been a chiropractor in the first place, I guess. But my last clinical rotation at physical therapy school, so you know, I went through the whole roller coaster, right? And the director of clinic, you no know, shoe she was feeling pretty bad for me and she was just doing her job and uh, so she said all right Joel you got one more rotation I'll whatever you ask for I'm gonna give it to you what are you looking for and I already did my hospital rotation I already did my you know, pediatrics uh, I almost yeah, I went looked in pediatrics as well but anyway so because <clears throat> I think it's high school there anyway so I said Okay, so I want an outpatient rotation because I need to get ready for my boards. And for my outpatient rotation, I want to go to a place where they do a lot of manual therapy because I want, if I do outpatient physical therapy, I'm going to do manual therapy. So I need to learn how to do it right, do it really, really well. And so she said, I know exactly where to send you. So, um, so. I can appreciate the value of the chiropractor, you know, the, the skill of the hand is not just massaging or mobilizing joints. I, I appreciated that. So, and I've, and I've had some injuries from work and from my regular checkups with my chiropractor, he's, he saved my career. You know, at the time I was learning, my body mechanics wasn't very good and I had like numbness and tingling down the outside of my left knee other time or my left thigh other times to my uh, right pinky toe you know uh, numbness to my left hand you know and I go see my chiropractor and, and he gets me all set and I leave pain free and I knew what exact exercise to do for myself so I'll just manage it from there I'll just keep it going but through the insta physical art learning more about the human body and the details of it I was able to pick up more of the nusha and uh, find other forms of help that I knew that I can also help myself with. It wasn't perfect, but you know, it helps to have someone who's not you to put their hands on you in, in certain ways that you can't really do for yourself and or they bring another value 
another skill set so that you may not be able to reproduce for yourself to get you pain free or moving better or whatever it may be. So I think there's, in that sense, I, I've, I've seen and experienced and thus I can appreciate the value that the chiropractor can bring to the patient and to the healthcare industry. Um, I also think chiropractors are really good with what they do, which is to uh, improve alignment and to get the nervous system firing. I think they're very good at that because that's, that's basically what they do. I think uh, in my practice, I like to uh, use the help from the chiropractor with that because with what I do and my training, I also know there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things that are not treated and are not looked at with chiropractor care as well. So it benefits me when my patients can see the chiropractor because number one, <laughs> to be honest, it makes less work for me. And then number two, I know that my patient is getting their nervous system firing, getting their alignment addressed uh, from the chiropractic paradigm. So I definitely see value with chiropractic. Did they answer the question? Yeah, that was a great answer, actually. Okay. So, like, it was a very interesting answer, I'd say. Mm. Like, one try to break your back, but, like, you still go there. I mean, mm. not to that guy, probably, no, but... No. <laughs> But well, why isn't like a combined art though? Like, is it that like the medical community views chiropractic as some sort of pariah and won't like like learn from their techniques, or is it like chiropractors want to keep it for themselves? Like, why can't there be like the type of like, I guess individual that can like bring your skill set and like combine it with like chiropractic and whatnot? When you say chiropractic, what do you, what do you mean? Well, I mean, like. Don't the chiropractors do some stuff that you don't do? Like, I don't think you do. You don't have like the the alignment gun that they often use. And like, why can't like, I guess traditional medical like medical establishment like incorporate I guess alignment techniques? Do they incorporate them? But like, why can't we just have like a combined art? Like, not need like, I guess have so many turf wars as you said right. earlier. So the way I. I think the question that I'm hearing is uh, why are all these different things and why not like one one thing that kind of addresses everything? Yeah. The way I explain this to patients when, when I hear these type of questions uh, because in the it's in the context of manual therapy, the way I explain it to patients is like Kung Fu, right? So if, you know, the eagle claw doesn't address all the problems that an enemy may throw at you, like someone's fighting you, right? Or like maybe the Shaolin Temple techniques may not address everything that uh, may help you defend yourself and or take down the person who's trying to mug you. Yeah, well, we have mixed martial arts these yes. days. We have MMA. Yeah. Like, why can't we have an MMA of medicine? Well, because, because in MMA, you know, the strikers will be strikers and then the ground guys will be the ground guys. You, it's hard to, and you can't be all around. You look at, you know, the, the MMA world, there isn't one person that's perfectly all around, right? You, they're, they're, they're probably strong enough. If you got a striker, they just need to be, they, they know where their strengths are. They know where their, what clicks of their passions are. So they're just going to be good enough so on the ground. Having a specialist, you, in your opinion, is still like beneficial. That's someone really in depth in what they do and like benefit the patient more than having one guy who like all around knows a lot, but doesn't have that like very detailed experience in doing his like particular thing. I, I think the patient needs all of it because so you use the word specialist right the thing is so i i stand on the shoulders of giants okay so uh that includes my mentor it also includes my anatomy professor dr O. shout out to you <laughs> uh from pt school and one of his graduate schools, pt school is like everyone wants to be a specialist you know he's just you know a retired medical family practice medical doctor you know and and uh and now that I practice, I realize I understand what he's saying, which is like everyone wants to be a specialist, but there aren't good, there aren't people who are good general practitioners, right? So I think that's also the case with uh, with physical therapy, in particular, what I do 
you know, is that, you know, with the art of the hand, I'm not saying I'm a generalist, right? It's, I, I just, for me, uh, for what I see, and I don't think I even speak for all functional manual therapists, even all certified functional manual therapists, but for me, I really see, like, whatever the problem is, the, the problem as the whole, but I wouldn't say that I'm a specialist in headaches or a specialist in migraines or with big toe problems or shoulder, knee, or low back because they're all interconnected. And if I, I know that in my business, in my practice, if I don't address those other areas, my patient will plateau very quick. I see. Well, on the patient side, like, I guess in America, what do you think are the biggest like health mistakes, I guess body wise in your field, like you see that people are making that contributes to like health problems? Like what's something people can avoid or do to just keep their health straight? Yeah, so I would say the thing to like what gets everyone? What's the thing that like gets people? I think people know too much and as a result I think they create problems for themselves um, and the reason I say that because I think you know in the information age that we're at if someone's got a problem they're gonna you know they're gonna they're gonna they need the solution so there's resources already there to help them get the solution and so uh, and how much is too much is really what I, I, I think, at least what I'll, I'll tell you what I tell my patients really, you know, if you can do a Google search or YouTube, something like that, don't go more than two clicks down the line so because you don't want to fall down the rabbit hole. Yeah. You don't want to go down the rabbit hole. And number two, you want to, you need to find someone that you can trust and uh not just trust in a way that's kind of that feels right for for this person but it's really um uh, someone that that just not just expertise wise but you know they match your personality they match your thinking style your belief in life your value system because um, all those things take into to play because there's there's this flow that I believe that takes place between a patient and in particular with a physical therapist or even any healthcare provider. Uh, and it's, and you know, it's, um, so like doctors are human at the end of the day. And if you can connect like on a human level, I guess it's going to be good for both of you. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, because the way to go is, uh, as and I lean on, on one of my teachers, Ken Kaiser, in his foundations course, he teaches abdication. So instead of this hierarchy of do what I tell you, it's more of abdication, meaning, hey, let's, let's solve this problem together um, so that uh, it's, it's just better that way because, yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like that answer especially about knowing too much because we really live in like a post-truth era when like the truth and information don't necessarily like co coalesce like there's so much information out there but the truth like oftentimes goes missing and all aspects of life are seen now like it's hard to even discern like even on YouTube there's no more dislike button <laughs> you know, like you don't know mm. if it's bad mm. so I guess what you're saying about um having someone you trust and like I guess has their best interest in mind is very impactful yes well do you think like the way um I guess you approach medicine and, like, I guess life in general like you mentioned your experience growing up in like the Korean church was your dad a pastor uh, he or, was an elder ah uh, yeah I know I know a lot of Koreans in the church you know I used to go to a Taiwanese church myself that like sense of community you get there is impactful but do you think, like, your faith, you said after the military you found Jesus as, like, really, I guess, impacted your work? Because mm. me, myself, I'm a Christian as well. Mm. And I personally believe that, I guess, like, if you live as a Christian, it's, like, the best way to approach things. Has that been, like, your life as well? I think it's also been good for my business. So, 
when my there I, I think uh, just being just doing a lot of listening rather than talking and so in my life so far there I've noticed certain uh, themes and certain what's called loops that keep looping itself and it loops around and every time it comes around it comes bigger 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 until you can't ignore it and, and then you address it so that you don't loop anymore you're able to continue forward and uh, <clears throat> and so with certain things uh, with my life, um, I find that uh, there there is no higher power than than Jesus Christ, and it's really you know my I adopt the vision that my wife had has for us, <laughs> so it's really having uh, like uh, a celebration of Sabbath, right? So my wife does high-end architecture with Silver Elm Studios that's shout out for her right and so she provides a place of rest and I provide a place of healing <laughs> and so my wife and I together I think as a as two business owners we try to uh, present Sabbath um, to our clients and for me it's for my patients and so it's very important for me to have a healing environment that's very accepting and that's, I mean, you've been to my place. It's not, it doesn't look like your typical physical therapy place. You know, it's got a lot of pictures. It's got a couch. It's got a lamp, you know. I like how spacious your um, area. Mm. Like a lot of doctor's offices, I guess people like, people have anxiety about going to the doctor, which mm. a lot of people don't really understand, I guess. Mm. I guess the medical profession itself doesn't understand. Like I have a cousin and um, she's black. She was adopted. Mm. Um, my dad's side of the family uh, from Haiti mm. and like one of the things she told me that was like really striking mm. and really stuck with me last time I met her is um, she doesn't trust the medical establishment at all like she mm. doesn't want to be in a hospital if she can avoid it mm. and so that was like really um, I guess touched me in a way because like someone I really care about having that deep level of like distrust mm. and something important as medicine like I guess it speaks volumes to like how like like being just very clinical and like methodical in your medicine isn't like the end all and be all of like really helping people in that way you know there's like a more I guess you gotta make it like cause healing is not only just your body no a lot of it's your mind yes like you agree with that right yes so and the heart yeah that's a big one too like we do so, I guess in modern medicine, we do so much like, you know, like treating the mind and whatnot. Mm. Like we throw so many different like drugs, be it SSRIs, be it amphetamines that people try to like make them right. Mm. But I guess like we don't ever, there's no like, there's no pill that can fill that spiritual void or that like void of belonging or just like peace inside someone. There's well, you take, you take on. LSD and you feel peace and belonging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, well, that's not like medically allowed. Right. You know? like, <laughs> that stuff. Some marijuana. Yeah, too, many people, too many people couldn't handle feel LSD. Good. They're like, like, they brought up too right. many demons, so they had to ban mm. it for everyone as a whole. Mm. But I mean, I guess like on that side of the discussion, my personal view is like, I guess how they're like managing like the drug issue these days mm. like it's probably the for the best because mm. like i don't think like like we should give out lsc at the pharmacy that'd be a bad idea yeah. because, like Real so i really agree some people shouldn't take that stuff um yeah. but i mean like i guess it's out there is what i'm saying mm. but i guess you think like like i mean this question started on like christianity and your faith Hmm. I guess it's morphed into I guess a philosophy of like medicine and where that hmm. so like where do you think like to move forward with medicine and like how it is currently now to I guess something better what's like an important step in your opinion like we have to take I think people need to be more aware not only of what they can do for themselves but how other people can help them it's um having trust in other people um accepting other people's differences and just taking the grain of salt 
from the help that's around them to give them the best mix for themselves. Do you have any questions on that? <laughs> you, you, you have to guide me through with that one. <laughs> I mean, it's very, like, full subject in terms of lots of, like, ways you approach it. Yeah. So I guess building trust do you think that starts at like the very like most basic level of human interactions? Yeah. Yes. So it's, the, it's the connection with another person. And even if it may not be what you want, whether as deep or superficial as you may want or the person listening here may want or may, uh, what I want, um, that there's some type of agreement between two parties and just enjoying that, just being... Just being present with that and just agree, enjoying the agreement of that and just just marvel in that agreement at that level and if and just see where it goes from there. You think that's getting lost on people like more and more increasingly? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because like when you just said that, it gave me a worry because you know I went to San Marino High School and they produce a lot of doctors, mm. but. I don't think they're producing that many people, like less and less, especially after COVID, of people, 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 you know? Mm. People who you can like relate to as a person. And I guess that's like something important that I guess is being lost, you know? Like, did COVID affect your business? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, in which way? More people need help? People are afraid to like get help? Well, it's so one of the things that. Uh, we treat is the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is very important for your overall health um, because it's one of the cranial nerves cranial nerve 10 the vagus nerve that uh, provides innervation to your uh, the the asymmetrical solid organs in your body and so it's not that you can have complete control over how your stomach is going to digest or how your liver functions or or kidneys or pancreas or you know, all those things are kind of this automatic mode and what I found with how COVID has impacted my practice is that I see more problems with that vagus nerve uh, there's a great book out there <clears throat> called uh, uh, it's, I guess another shout out a uh, healing power of the vagus nerve uh, by I'm trying to remember the name and uh, that work was uh, built off of, of uh, I remember what my mentor said, uh, uh, the polyvagal theory by Dr. Stephen Porges. And basically that premise is that the autonomic nervous system is not, at least particularly in the human system, is not just sympathetic and parasympathetic black white taste great less feeling what's the autonomic nervous system it's been a while since i've been oh biology. okay right on okay so the autonomic <laughs> nervous system is is the basic thing is i explain it is your fight flight and your rest and digest oh so the, the fight mode, yeah. yeah right so you really spun up or you're not right and with steve dr stephen porges polyvagal polyvagal theory Basically, what he he argues is the case that's more than just uh, the the taste great less filling, in the particularly in the human being. There's a third component, which is the socialization part. And so you can have someone who's really wound up uh, with the socialization part, right? And so that's someone who'd be like, "Oh my goodness, it's so good to see you," right? Whereas someone's really wound up. Uh, without the socialization and this probably is maybe like really hyper but without really engaging for who you are and so it might feel socially awkward you got this round of guy that does we're gonna recognize your presence so the the socialization part is i think what's really impacted our community um, because of that social socialization so everyone's got this the taste great less filling lacking the socialization part and as a result it's been impacting the vagus uh vagus nerve system 
and thus the patients that you're presenting me with, uh, and I'm, and I know a lot of uh, fellow uh, you know certified functional manual therapists have been seeing this because it's been on discussions in, in our Google group and such. It's just COVID has really messed up people's polyvagal system. Wow. Yeah. What you just said was very actually profound. And I guess it really relates to a lot of stuff because um, like what we didn't realize with the lockdown, sure we're like it's preventing people spraying the food of like COVID. Mm-hmm. But there's never been a time like this where you like a similar example of like this type of social like isolation and like, I've talked everyone like who's like been involved like dealing with people's like I've talked to have that some sort of experience like I am um, good family friend Mr. Ron Gano, mm-hmm. used to be a third grade teacher recently retired because he thought schools are getting too like political I guess mm-hmm. but he said that after COVID like he had third graders um acting like first graders mm-hmm. and like like crawling on the floor sometimes oh wow yeah like regression I've mm-hmm. noticed that in my school I just graduated but this last mm. year of school has been very strange. Mm. Like some people just like they don't know how to behave anymore. Like even me, I I, got, I was rusty, you know. Like socially, like I'm still functional, but you know, if just, like the like the cleanness was off. And hearing from you how this like even impacts pe- impacts people on like this medical level. Mm-hmm. I guess like people really um forget about like humans as a social creature, and that's like a very central part of our like prognosis and our pathology is really decided on yeah. and, and if i could jump in like even these masks the ones that hook around the ears yeah i've been seeing i've been seeing a lot more headaches and what i've been finding is those those things that loop around the back of the ears it's been compressing the the, the bones on the side of their skull it's called the temporal bone and it's been compressing it forward into uh, certain parts of the skull and what i've been finding with the patients and usually when i see them they got their mask on tight like this are okay i'm going to physical therapy i'm getting some medical health right i'm, I'm not in a hospital it's just me it's, you know a solo private you know boutique you know physical therapy practice and they're just coming to see me and they got their mask super tight and i'm like do you wear your mask like that it's like oh it's like oh yeah i could take it off if you want to okay and then you see, and then I feel their bone, and it's just, so all I do is just decompress that, and their headache feels better. Wow, so you should wear, like, the other type of mask. Then, that goes well, what I've been there. telling my patients, you know, this is not medical advice, right? But what I've been telling my patients, um, you know, have you thought of just switching it up? You know, is, you know, they have those masks that just doesn't go around the ear. You know, they got the other ones that go around the back of the head. Now, those ones, the patients that I also see that they only wear those, I've been seeing a lot of what's called anterior shear. That's uh, the bones of the neck actually being pushed forward into kind of like a spondy <laughs> of the cervical spine. And so they see me for like other problems, like C2 problems <laughs> with anterior shearing on it or like compression of the occipital bone because of that pressure of the band. And again, I'm like, hey, you know, they have those other masks that go around the ears. Yeah, that's actually mind blowing. COVID's even affected our like our bones. Yeah, absolutely. It affects behavior. You know, one of the things that I'm also studying that I find very curious is craniosacral therapy, and I'm kind of working towards my way towards certification for that. Just so my curiosity, my my professional curiosity. It's not that I'm looking for accolades or letters after my name. I just need that validation, and um, <clears throat> and the those those straps around the for those masks when i do some craniosacral therapy is pretty profound as to the extent of more than just position of the bones actually within the membranes and the you know the dural neural system you know like i you probably ask what the dura is you know it's uh what i tell patients is it's the ziploc bag that covers the brain and the spinal cord Right, so that compression of the skull has been impacting the membrane inside the skull and thus impacting the dural system. And it's been effect- affecting the entire system. <laughs> like it's your been, mood would change because of that? Um, that's, I, or just how you feel? That, that, I, I think it's more of how you feel, maybe mood, because when patients see me, you know, they, they may feel lighter or 
like for example you know after first treated you like you, you fell asleep on the table because we did some cranial sickle therapy on that sacrum visit just to clean stuff up and um <clears throat> one of the four uh one of the first osteopaths who not cranial sickle therapy but before that trying to remember the name uh with dr sutherland he used those little clamps on the skull to really understand how the impact of certain pressure on different parts of the skull bones can impact one's uh, behavior. And his wife uh, also documented his, his moods and how he presented. So they were doc he was documenting his internal state and what he perceived of the world, while his wife was documenting what she saw from her perspective. And they saw impact from certain pressures in the skull you know this is before the MRIs and you know knowing the Broca area for speech and all these different areas for motor and sensory and you know all these things and uh, I think they're definitely onto something and so there might be some truth if you will quote-unquote with uh, Dr. Sutherland's work and the impact of the how some of these straps of these masks may be affecting uh, as you said behave uh, uh, behavior and I agree with you on maybe how someone may feel and thus other things that I've seen clinically that's impacted my practice with the whole COVID situation. Well, the socialization aspect is very um, interesting as well like one example I guess people talk about socialization is um, like about like one to five percent of like little boys I don't know if the statistics are right but like a little bit of them like hyper aggressive like they'll just hit people and not train to you know mm -hmm. And like, if they're socialized well, you know, they become a very high function member of society, very effective. Without that, they kind of become like dangerous in some way or not. You know, they'll become like maybe borderline personality or like antisocial personality traits will emerge in them. Mm. And so I guess like, so we know there's like a psychological impact based off like socialization and COVID definitely like has some effect on that. Hmm. But then, like, when you talk about the vagus nerve, like, where is the vagus nerve even? Uh, the vagus nerve comes out of your skull. So it comes in between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. <laughs> you can, uh, your listeners can Google that. And where they meet together, uh, you've got those, the two bones meet together. One has, like, a semicircle hole. The other one has a semicircle hole. And where those two bones meet on the skull, they make a circle. And that circle is called the jugular foramen, and that's where the vagus nerves comes out, and it drapes down the. And you can Google vagus nerve, and you go to image, and there's this one picture, where it's kind of the background's all blue and black, and the, the vagus nerve is just lit up, and you can see how it just drapes down the side of your neck. So the right side will drape down the side of your neck through the thoracic inlet, uh, which is. Uh, or the the ring of T1 and first rib and the clavicle going through there and it innervates everything on the right side so the right side of the heart the liver gallbladder you know uh, <clears throat> the hepatic flexure so it's one of those like central nerves that like yes, regulate stuff absolutely so vital and the fact that like not just you but like many of your like colleagues have been noticing the issues around that's pretty pretty mind-blowing has there been any like research being published on this are people looking more into it oh i'm sure yeah i've, I've been really busy with running my business <laughs> so running my practice so uh but research is definitely an interest of mine not not as professionally but just more maybe just to help other people um just not looking for fame or anything like that but just just more of a if the need is strong enough i know i'll do it well, that's interesting. Like, the biggest impact you saw on COVID isn't, I guess, like, from COVID itself necessarily, at least in your practice. Like, you don't probably see people who, like, who have COVID, obviously, like, currently. But, like... Knock on wood. <laughs> I mean, you must have. I mean, these days, are COVID, like, the new sure. variants I'm sure. strange. I'm sure I have. Have you had COVID? Yes. Yeah, me too. It wasn't that bad for me. I've got the first vaccine, but I, like, haven't really, like... I don't really want to get another one because yeah. I don't see like I mean like they don't like know how long it lasts really which variants attacking for I know. I, the boosters I this whole political thing with it I don't know I don't even if it's not political I don't know 
Yeah, it's, well, it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff, and like so much information, like you said, that like crazy world. I mean, it is what it is. But I mean, if hey, people like you doing their little thing to help people it makes a tick in the end of the day. Yeah. So, like, any last things you really would like to, like people know about what you do, or like anything from them on terms of like I guess physical therapy wise. Yeah, so I, I want them to know that uh, so that there is a practice down in San Marino, okay, and uh, and that practice really wants to help them, and uh, I think that practice can help them in really profound ways, and I and there's definitely a potential for people to not only recover quicker than what they think they can compared to just traditional insurance-based physical therapy. But it's really just knowing that, hey, when they, it's, that it's more than just a human body, you know. It's when their human body feels better, you know, they just connect people up with other people much better. Um, so my private practice is called Total Potential Physical Therapy. And it's called Total Potential because my mentor, Greg Johnson, uh, which he's, his mentor was Maggie Knott, and Maggie Knott believed that every person had a hidden existing potential. And that was something that my mentor, uh, my mentors, Greg and Vicky Johnson, uh, believe in their students and in their patients. And it really impacted my life, and so I put that in the, my company name, which is just total, just everything, mind, body, soul, you know, life choices, lifestyle, total potential uh, physical therapy. And uh, we're right there on 2100 Huntington Drive, San Marino. Uh, they can call or text us, 424-254-9273. And uh, for all the, your, as a thank you to you and to all your listeners, I actually want to uh, put a promo code. So if you're listening to this podcast, uh, you can call or text us, once again, 424-254-9273. And if you text Jacob Podcast, and uh, what you get is a risk-free 30-minute discovery session with me. And uh, you'll pretty much get about a 40% discount for the next two visits, uh, which is $120 each. Um, So... Uh, so I just want to say thank you to uh, you, Jacob, and, and your crew, and uh, they can use that promo we'll code and, and reach out to us. All you need to reach Dr. Joel Kim. Hope you guys enjoyed the pox. Thanks for coming on. I learned it. No problem. Um, thank you. And, well, thanks.